Which games are must bets for week eight of the 2024 NFL season? What's going on, Grid Iron Gamblers and football fans? It's Mitch here with my five favorite spread picks of week eight. Last week, disaster. It's been a roller coaster of a season. But last time we had a bounce back week, we really had a bounce back week. So it's time for another one. If that sounds good, Gronk spike the like button and don't forget to subscribe. Back to the basics. Let's get started, guys. Let me know in the comments your favorite spread pick of week eight. I can't believe that I picked three games where three teams led by 10 points and then lost. That sounds fun. Let's start with the first pick of week number eight. We always begin, if we're going to throw Thursday Night Football into the mix with Thursday Night Football for relevancy, that is the Minnesota Vikings, minus three, on the road at the Los Angeles Rams. I understand the games in LA. I understand that Sean McVay understands Kevin O'Connell's offense, and there's familiarity there. And I get that Cooper Cup is back. Wow. But these two teams are not even close to the same level. These two teams are not anywhere close. Let's break it down. Beginning with the Vikings offense. The Vikings offense has been pretty steady all season. And the one thing that has allowed them to remain consistent is their rushing attack led by Aaron Jones. The Los Angeles Rams have a weak rush defense, even allowing the putrid Raider rushing attack to rush for 90 yards with Alexander Madison, one of the Vikings' old friends. Aaron Jones has looked like peak Aaron Jones in moments, even including his first big run against the Lions last week. He's a dynamic runner. They added Cam Akers. They want to run the football. Ty Chandler behind Aaron Jones. And even on this short week, I see Aaron Jones exploding for a few big gains. And I just think that consistency keeps pressure off Sam Darnold, which is really the important part. The ability to control the clock. The ability to keep possession. The ability to put the Rams' Matthew Stafford on his toes and keep him on the sidelines. And Stafford's one of those quarterbacks that presses when he falls behind and he does make mistakes. And he's made a lot of mistakes in recent games, including against the Raiders. He looked not great, including against the Bears. He looked not ideal. So I look at this clash of the Vikings ball possession offense, running the football, play action. They did a phenomenal job against the Lions of picking up the Lions extra rushers, their blitzes. And that was through play action. So imagine rushing attack, running the ball on the Rams, running the ball, pulling it back for play action with a blitz. You got Justin Jefferson one-on-one -on -one with weak cornerbacks. You got Jordan Addison one-on-one -on -one with weak cornerbacks. I think the Vikings have decisive edges on the perimeter. I think the Vikings have an excellent offensive line and excellent offensive lines travel well. I think they can run the football. And we've seen Sam Darnold if you give him those one-on-ones, he can hit them and he can get down the field. I also think he's been much better against zone this year than man because he's a little imperfect on his accuracy and ball placement at times. But against zone, you have more room for error. You have more margin in your throws. And because Kevin O'Connell is such a wizard at scheming up flood concepts, and different you know, route combinations to allow them to dissect these zone coverages. Darnold can find open guys on crossers, you know, deep corner routes, things like that, against zone coverage. So I see Darnold having success, having time, because he's got a very good tackle duo against a good pass rush, but not a great pass rush. No Aaron Donald, right? And I think they're going to run the ball. So I think the Vikings are going to be able to dictate the game through their offense. On the flip side, that's exactly where the Vikings defense wants to be. The Vikings defense is probably the most opportunistic unit on defense this year. Like they punch the ball out, they intercept, they sack, they strip sack, 
and they create negative plays. And that's all because of Brian Flores. Remember, Sean McVay has faced Brian Flores before in big spots. I specifically recall a game where Jared Goff pooped his pants when he was still on the Rams. That was in Miami, and I think the Rams got obliterated like 40 to 7. You guys can look that game up. That was Brian Flores' defense sending zero blitzes at Jared Goff just continuously, right? Jared Goff now with Ben Johnson looks a lot better. So that also makes me believe that maybe that wasn't Jared Goff. Maybe part of it was Sean McVay's system. And there was something about the system that Brian Flores was so familiar with. You also go back to that Super Bowl of the Patriots versus the Rams where they shut the Rams down. So I think Flores gives the Vikings a huge edge here because the Vikings can stop the run. I don't think the Rams will be able to run the ball that effectively against Minnesota. Minnesota's pretty healthy on defense. Minnesota's got two really good edge rushers. Andrew Van Ginkle and Jonathan Grenard are very underrated. They can send a plethora of blitzes. And I think that the game plan for the Rams is basically going to be quick passing. The Vikings are very good at rallying to the football, at tackling. They don't allow a lot of yards after catch. So I just love the matchups on both sides of the ball from a football standpoint. And I also feel like, yeah, McVay might know O'Connell, but it feels like Flores knows McVay. And it feels like the Vikings are just much more talented, especially on the defensive side of the football. So yeah, Stafford's better than Darnold, but the way they're playing right now, I really don't see it as a huge edge. So I think the Vikings should win this game decisively. They are one of the six best teams in football at minimum. The Rams feel like they're barely a top 20 team, if not at all. And they could even be trading Cooper Cup if they lose this game. So, yeah, the Vikings are, to me, just an undervalued team at minus three. They were minus what? Two and a half at home against the Lions? Minus two, minus one and a half? Against the Lions at home, and yeah, they lost, but it was barely. They barely lost. They led with like two minutes left. And that, yeah, that was at home, but that was against the Lions, not the Los Angeles Rams. So I like the favorite on Thursday night. Moving to the Sunday slate. Our first pick is going to be the Buffalo Bills, minus three. And this is in order of preference. So the Buffalo Bills, minus three at Seattle. The one thing to look out for here, or there's actually two. One is weather-related. There could be rain. We'll get into why that actually could be good for the Bills. Number two, DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf has a sprained MCL. DK Metcalf is one of the most explosive, best receivers in football. Without DK Metcalf, the Seahawks offense goes from pretty promising, pretty good, to like mid at best. Because DK Metcalf is a one-play touchdown. And when you remove a one-play touchdown from a explosive passing offense, it becomes a lot less dangerous. And you can overplay other things like the run game. So DK is very important. I actually expect him to miss this game or if not be very hindered. So I think that's a major advantage for the Bills. Meanwhile, Buffalo is very healthy on offense. They pretty much have everybody, including another week to intertwine Amari Cooper into their plans. Defensively, they're getting healthier, and their secondary, pretty much fully healthy. Their linebacking core outside of Milano, healthy. Their defensive line, almost healthy. So, And what I love here for Buffalo, Seattle, defensively, has been very weak against the run. Atlanta ran it all over them, despite losing by like three touchdowns. Atlanta did. But Bijan had over 100 yards, if you look at the numbers. Jordan Mason was having a great game. He got injured. They put in Isaac Garendo. I was at the game. The 49ers ran all over Seattle. They dominated them physically on Thursday night. And that was in Seattle. The Giants went to Seattle again, dominated them up front, play action them to death, and ran the ball with Tyrone Tracy. Right? These are not exactly Barry Sanders and Jim Brown that we're talking about here. So I look at the Bills, and I think they have actually one of the most underrated rushing attacks in football. I think James Cook, Ray Davis, Ty Johnson could all have big games running the football. And I love how Buffalo is very diverse in their rushing attack, and you can't ever overplay their rushing attack because Josh Allen is their quarterback. If you overplay it, he's going to make plays down the field. He's going to extend plays with his legs, and he's going to make rocket shots into tight windows That if you play man, you're toast against Josh Allen. If you play zone, he's going to find the hole. And 
if it's in the rain, that might actually add more value to Buffalo because Gino is a pocket passer. Gino is slippery with the football and a little less accurate than you would think. And I feel like he at least has his tendencies to, to miss a little bit, Gino, especially against the Niners, he did. Uh, I would say that Josh Allen can run. Josh Allen can have designed rushes in the game if it's raining. So red zone stuff, right? Like he could have 10 carries in this game if it gets to raining. So plus Amari Cooper is another dimension that the Seahawks have to account for with their corners. And Reek Woolen's been injured for a couple of weeks. We'll see if he makes his return. But I, I think that, you know, Amari can make some plays out there. Shakir could be a challenging matchup in the slot. And Coleman had a great game as more of the number three option. You also got to deal with Dalton Kincaid. We saw George Kittle have a big game against the Seahawks. He could make his way to the end zone one or two times too. So yeah, the Bills, I just feel, are decisively the better team. They are a tier above Seattle. Seattle feels like maybe a wild card team, while Buffalo feels like a lock to win their division and an AFC contender and a Super Bowl contender. I didn't even really talk about the Bills' defense, but... The only real weakness is their run defense, and I don't feel convinced Seattle can run the ball all over Buffalo. They're not an overpowering run game. They're more of a finesse running game, and that's the type of running game that Buffalo tends to stop. Buffalo also has a very good pass rush. Greg Russo and Ed Oliver could have a day against Geno Smith, and they have one of the best corner trios in football with Christian Benford, Rasul Douglas, and Teron Johnson taking on Tyler Lockett, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, and maybe DK Metcalf. So I just love the Bills. I think they match up very well from a football standpoint here. I'm going to back Josh Allen minus a field goal. Next up, the Green Bay Packers minus four. I put this game before my next game because it's in the middle of the day, as opposed to my next game being in prime time. But the Green Bay Packers are minus four at Jacksonville, and this just feels like not proper value for the Packers and the Jags. I just feel like the Jags are overvalued. I even felt like they were overvalued last week, and that's why I gave it to you as a bet, not because I'm a Patriots fan last week. You know, what did we see? The Patriots were up 10 nothing, and if they weren't like the worst coach team in football with the worst O-line in football and the worst defense I've ever seen— they might have been able to cover that game, right? And they almost did, actually, in the end. But the Packers are a much different tier of team. Plus, there's some weird things going on with this game. So a couple reasons matchup-wise, a couple reasons logistically. First of all, the Jags have to travel back from Europe. That does have something to do with this game. I mean, they have to play the week following playing in London for two weeks. So they have to get their body clocks resituated to Jacksonville and Eastern time zone, which I don't know how long that will take, but I definitely feel like that will have a little bit of an impact, maybe just a little bit. I also feel like the Packers are humming right now offensively and as a team. I love how their defense played against the Texans. I think the Texans are a better offense than Jacksonville. And I do think Jacksonville has an equally bad offensive line. And I do think the Packers can take advantage of their offensive line with the blitzes and with their front four like they did with the Texans. Trevor Lawrence tends to hold on to the ball. And Trevor Lawrence can be a little bit sloppy back there. He's a very clunky player. I feel like the Packers can get to him. I think Jair can match up with Brian Thomas a little bit better than the previous teams have. And I actually was really impressed by the Packers' sticky coverage against Houston. That was something I didn't think they would be willing to offer. I think Tank Bigsby has been good, but I don't necessarily think he's going to just run over the Green Bay front either. So I think the Packers can keep the Jags in check on that side of the ball. But where I really love this game from a matchup standpoint is Jordan Love and his receivers against a heavy man coverage team. Jordan Love loves to pick matchups. And Matt LaFleur is a master at finding matchups and finding scheme to get his receivers wide, butt-ass naked open. And I could see, you know, Jaden Reed having a dominant game from the slot. I think Watson is always a problem in man because he's so fast. And Wicks is a savvy route runner and separator. And Romeo Dobbs can go up and get it. And if, Ty if Campbell is their number one guy, and he was back last week against the Patriots, if he takes on Romeo Dobbs, I just feel those other three that might actually be better against man end up just having better games. And then the Packers can run the ball on pretty much everybody, so I'm not too concerned about that. The Packers are just like a really good team. They have a very well-rounded team. They're very well coached. Doug Peterson has had sloppy fourth down decisions. 
The Jags allowed Drake May, a rookie quarterback, in his second start to pretty much make them look pathetic defensively. And if it were not for the Patriots just really allowing the Jags to possess the ball the entire game, I feel like the Patriots could have easily won a shootout. But, you know, this is a different tier of team. Patriots were one of the worst teams in the league. Yeah, Jags maybe got right a little bit. Packers are a different level. So I'm going to go Green Bay minus four at Jacksonville. I'm not scared of, of laying it on the road here. Next up, Sunday Night Football. The San Francisco 49ers are laying four at Dallas. I love this matchup for the 49ers from a physical matchup perspective. I have for the past couple of years and pretty much every time I've been right about this game. This has always been one of my more heavily bet games of the year. And it, it probably will be a fairly heavily bet game. But I will say that because of the injuries of the Niners, it won't be as decisive as years past. But... I just love when Kyle Shanahan plays a team that can't stop the run because Kyle Shanahan is one of the best run designers in NFL history and his teams are always very effective at running the ball. And so when you can run the ball the way that they should be able to, we saw them do it against Seattle, right? Kansas City was actually a very good run defense. Niners started to figure out how to run the ball in the second half, but they got behind so much they had to throw. But... What I'll say about this matchup is Dallas has a historically bad run defense. I don't care if Parsons is playing or not. He's not exactly the best run defender in the world. Two, if Debo plays, that would be nice. I don't know if he'll play. He might, though. Jawan Jennings probably will play, so at least they have one reliable receiver. They still got George Kittle. And I do think that Ricky Pearsall, Cowing, these other guys can, if Kyle knows they're going to play a lot. He can find ways to get them to be effective because he's just that good of a coach. I'm not that worried. Plus, it's a Brock Purdy bounce back week against a team that he's had success against prior. Kittle also torches the Cowboys regularly because they do not have a good man-to-man -man stopper for him at safety or linebacker. So Kittle could have a massive game. Defensively is where I actually really love this game. So it's, it's a combination of run, offense, and defense. The Niners defense, I think, is actually kind of being slept on. Like, I think it's a pretty good unit while people are kind of like going after it and attacking it. They've been one of the better pass defenses all season, and they looked really good against Geno, and they looked really good against Pat Mahomes. Dak is an easily rattled quarterback in these settings, especially on the road in a Sunday night game where they played last year on the road in a Sunday night game, and the Niners won 42 to 10, and Dak looked awful. There was a playoff game against the Niners where Dak looked awful. And I just feel like the Niners understand how to attack Dak and how to get the worst out of Dak. I think Lenore has been phenomenal at corner for them and he can match up whether in the slot or outside because he plays both positions with CD Lamb and they will probably double him occasionally. I don't think the Cowboys can run the ball on anyone. So that would be my primary concern with the Niners defense. And I just don't feel like Dallas can do that. Fred Warner is a monster. I, I love that guy. Nick Boza and Leonard Floyd are a really solid edge duo that can get after two terrible tackles in the Dallas Cowboys. Rookie and Terrence Steele, who's just not good at football. And the secondary options of Dallas' offense are just not that effective. Like, I you know, Jalen Tolbert is just like, whatever. And the tight end, Jake Ferguson, is he's a good player, but like he catches a bunch of five yard passes. Like it's not, it's not really dangerous. Right. And Fred Warner could probably take him out one-on-one. -on -one. So I just think the Niners are the much better team, even more, you know, even you look at things like DVO, DVOA EPA, like the Niners are ranked top 10 in both offense and defense while the Cowboys are like bottom 10 in like both categories. The only area that Dallas really has a advantage is special teams. And that's really it. But I feel like this game will be dominated by the Niners' defense and their running game to the point where four points won't really even matter that much. Uh, I think the only reason this game would be super close is if Dallas reinvents itself off the bye week and their defense all of a sudden is way better against the run and Brock Purdy just poops himself again. But I'm not expecting that to happen two weeks in a row. My fifth and final best bet this week, I'm going to do it. I'm going to fade my Patriots, uh, Jets minus seven. And you guys can take this bet or not. I mean, I don't know if you guys like to bet the Patriots when I tell you to bet the Patriots or if you like to fade the Patriots when I tell you to bet the Patriots or if you like to 
actually fade me when I tell you not to pick the Patriots, but I don't know how this all works. But anyways, yeah, I'm including it because I thought about a couple other games. I thought about Miami. I thought about the Steelers. I thought about the Bengals, a couple different options, but ultimately I landed on the Jets. And, and when I just really think about it from a football perspective and try to remove all bias because, and really the biggest bias I have when it comes to Patriots right now is I just think Drake May is a f stud. Like Drake May is really really good for a rookie and I don't think people have caught up to that but the Patriots as a team are awful and I think there's areas of their team that are extremely overrated like their defense for example which was expected to be like elite but in recent weeks it's been awful like they can't stop the run they can't cover they can't get a pass rush and the main areas I'm concerned against the Jets if I'm a Patriots fan they can't rush the passer at all and if Aaron Rodgers has time, he looks like a MVP because he's still accurate. He can still throw a crisp ball, but when he doesn't get pressure, right, like he's able to get it out on time to the right guy. He can read a defense really well. He can pick you apart if he has time. But when he played the Steelers, when he played, you know, the Niners, when he played good pass rushes this year, he has been a little distraught because he he's not good with pressure. But New England can't pressure. So that's one. Two, New England's run defense is awful. They got absolutely dominated and manhandled by Jacksonville. The Jets' run game is pretty good, led by Brees Hall and Allen. And we already saw these two teams play. The Jets won by, what, 24 points in New York? This spread's only seven? I mean, Drake May is a lot better than Jacoby Brissett, don't get me wrong, but... What I saw from that tape was the Patriots couldn't run the ball worth a lick, and they haven't been able to run the ball really in a while. Ramondre is also injured. The Patriots' O-line just got exposed against the Blitz when the Jets sent it. The Jets have really good corners, and they're all healthy. And if the Jets have a similar game plan to what they did in Week 3, I think it was, Week 3, if they have a similar game plan of playing more man than usual and more blitz than usual, and they just man up these receivers that are not very good, Drake won't have a chance, like, honestly. So as much as I like Drake, if the Jets just sit back in zone and they concede the run and they allow New England to get it going that way and play action them to death, then potentially New England could put up some points on the Jets because the Jets' defense has been a bit overrated but the one area I still really like the, the Jets' defense is I think they're, they're pretty effective in their pass rush, especially if Hassan Reddick plays. McDonald is going to torch the Patriots. Two, their pass defense overall is still pretty good. Their run defense is their biggest issue, and New England just hasn't been able to run the ball lately. I just don't see them being able to run the ball. So between the ball control from the Jets' offense and the pass defense of the Jets— I think this becomes a game where maybe New England starts off pretty well, but the Jets' talent, overwhelming talent advantage, plus the fact that they brought in Devontae Adams, they brought in Hassan Reddick. This team needs to win. If they lose, their season's over. So they need to make a statement. They need to have a, a rebound game. They looked really good until halftime against the Steelers and something went wrong. New England's home field advantage right now is super overrated. Their fans don't really care about anything except for Drake May. Trust me, I'm a Pats fan. So the Jets are desperate. The Jets need to win. The Patriots like think they're going to get the first pick. There's just so much different about these two teams. So for me, despite the records only being like one win apart, the Jets are in a totally different mindset. So give me the Jets minus seven. I think they should win by at least 10, uh, maybe like 14. I could see something like 27 to 17 something like that, or 30 to 20, something like, I could see that. So Jets minus seven will be my final, fifth and final best bet. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, Gronk Spike the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. It's Mitch of the BLV. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.